I'm Luca Giliberti, contributing writer at Gold Derby, joined today by Leo Ban and Rafael Rodriguez, who wrote and directed the live action short film, uh, Censor of Dreams, also known as uh, Le Censeur des Rêves, uh, which has been shortlisted for this year's Academy Awards. First off, uh, congratulations. And um, we'll actually start right there because this film made its world premiere at last year's uh, Warsaw film, Fe film Festival, where um, it won the Oscar qualifying Grand Prix. So what does it mean to you to, after this initial acknowledgement, be shortlisted in such an exclusive category of short films? Yeah, but actually it's like, uh, it was totally unexpected, you know, like to be uh, shortlisted like that, you know, it was like, uh, you know, we come from Paris, from French, and so like the Oscars can look really far away, you know what I mean, you know, and so for us, all the process through the festivals and the, the yeah, the viewing and everything, you know, was uh, good and really interesting and we couldn't <clears throat> expect that, you know, it's so it's amazing and we, uh, yeah, we hope that we can go further, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. And and before we dive into the film itself, um, I would like to touch on the process of adaptation since um, the film is adapted from a short story uh, by a Japanese author. And I read that you initially thought it would make a, a terrible short film, but uh, ended up going for the short film format anyway. So why did you ultimately think that short film would be the right format for this story? Whoever wants to go first. Um, I, I would say that uh, maybe because uh, I was reading a lot of uh, short stories, thinking about what to adapt into a short film. And maybe I was a bit too expecting the perfect story. And so I read that one. I found like, yeah, it's quite nice. But yeah, I'm not sure it's going to be a good uh, short film. And still reading some other ones. But then after the idea kept running into my mind. And I felt like, uh, okay, maybe there, there's something to do with it. And I, I presented it to uh, Raphael. And, uh, and we felt like maybe there is something to, uh, to do uh, with it, even if at the first glance, it seems quite difficult to adapt, but maybe there is something to do with it. So that's what we tried. Yeah, no, actually, you know, yeah, the, the story, you know, the, the short story was interesting in its concept, but it was like, it was good reading it. But uh, everything was a bit pedestrian, the way it was written. So it was, for us, it was a bit hard to imagine how uh, it, it could be like that, straight like that, you know, on, on camera. And so, yeah, as Leo said, you know, we had to rewrite a, a bit the things to bring a bit of, a bit of mystery, a bit of, um, of interest visually. That was, you know, as a, when you do an adaptation, there is always work to do. Mm -hmm. uh, to make it uh, good for the yeah for more visual yeah yeah because like, there is like there is something a bit difficult in the in the story is like the two main characters are basi basically seated the whole time mm -hmm. at a desk and it in terms of mise en scène it felt a bit difficult like we wanted to have something more visual with more movement and finally we find uh, some interpretation and and, uh, and changing the story to have like more. A, a more visual approach and a little bit more of movement. Yeah, that sounds uh, incredibly uh, fascinating. And I know that the two of you have known each other for uh, quite a while now and that you actually started collaborating on uh, music videos and, and commercials. And what has that step been like uh, from doing music videos and commercials, which, which are very visual, to now, in this case, uh, adapting a story? Yeah, I would say, you know, it's really different and not totally. You yeah. know, it's, uh, yeah, for us, it was, you know, the, the, we have this habit, as you said, to work together. So to brainstorm as a group, because Megaforce is four people first. And uh, so we have this habit to, to challenge the ideas, challenge the vision of, uh, of a film. So we don't have this, uh, we have this kind of humility, let's say, this to, uh, to not, you know, like to share ideas and accept that some, someone can think, think something different. The big difference there was like it's uh, a music video. It comes from an, an, an artist. Um, a commercial comes from a brand. <laughs> and here there is no like um, there is nobody. There is no client. So it's uh, it's only about us. So the, I think it was a major difference. You know when you do fictions, uh, it has to come from you. You know this is this is a big thing. So it's but the the process was slightly uh, similar. Let's say. And 
I read that you actually, uh, I think, Leo, you already mentioned this briefly before, but uh, that you actually had to end up cutting some text from the script once you started working uh, with your actors. So could you talk about why you ultimately made that decision? Um, it, it's basically uh, in, the, in the short story, uh, the characters are explaining a lot what they are doing. And it's like quite interesting for the for the reader, but if you make it in a, in actual uh, film, uh, the characters don't have a real reason to say that, and it, it makes it a, a bit too pedestrian or like or even a bit theatrical. And we wanted the character to be pretty believable somehow. So we uh, we said, okay, it's going to be more difficult for the audience to understand what they are doing. So we're going to ask them more attention somehow, but we want the character to feel real. So we uh, wrote the lines uh, they are saying, and it has to make total sense that they are saying this, even if the audience is not really understanding first, but it's sort of a game. You start, you are, there is quite a mystery. You don't know what they are talking about, but you are, you are trying to understand. And uh, we quite like to uh, to ask the audience to be attentive to the details and to make their own uh, understanding somehow. Yeah, and I think that really comes through because it is just so fascinating to, to just watch this film unfold. And you really do have to pay attention. You really have to pay attention. You don't have the words to sort of uh, rely on, which I thought as a viewer was uh, great. And this film explores the uh, Freudian theory of a sensor of dreams uh, and the concept of, of mourning through the prism of uh, dream mechanics. So could you briefly uh, explain this theory and, and what was important to you when um, representing it in this film? Yeah, if you want to, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's an interesting theory, uh, saying like the, the process of denial, you know, when you, yeah. you don't want to hear something and and you're trying to hide yourself this. And uh, it's, it's basically exploring this denial process even into the dreams. And basically, when you are dreaming, there are a lot of uh, things coming from your subconscious, from your memories, a lot of elements coming from that. And uh, uh, sometimes you just don't want to hear about them or you, you just want to meet those uh, elements or those uh, souvenirs uh, and memories. And basically, Freud made a a theory that there is like a, a sort of sensor who's trying to change all those things and to make them different because you don't want to see them. And, uh, and basically, Yasukata uh, Tsutsui, the, uh, the author of the original story, made, made a literal uh, metaphor of it, which is quite interesting. Absolutely. And um, what I really loved in this film um, was that making dreams is very much like a film shoot. Um, in which the protagonist, uh, played by Damien Bonnard, is moderating the dreams uh, of his host. Mm -hmm. What do you think this need to control dreams or moderate dreams perhaps says about us human beings in real life? Um, um, <laughs> maybe I, I would say that dreams, they are a bit like fictions, you know, they are like stories with a a hidden meaning in it. And uh, I think uh, dreams are, are quite important. We, we don't have to control them, but it's it's interesting to uh, to try to understand what they try to mean, you know, and and somehow if we follow the theory of the sensor of dreams, some, sometimes we have to try to fight the censorship and to try to understand uh, what's the meaning behind this whole uh, hidden uh, thing, you know? Mm. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's it's a theory, you know, it's a concept, you know, is uh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's something that obsesses us, you know, the dreams. You know, I have a, I have a lot of books about it. And there are a lot of theories, but actually, you know, it's it's like it's still a, a mystery. You know, we don't really know how it works, so it's more like so. It's interesting because maybe one day we will have the the solution of the, <laughs> the answer about what how it works really but i i, I have some doubt about that you know so it's, it's quite <laughs> it's a good concept a good um, a good topic let's say yeah yeah i completely agree and um to get into your work with the actors uh briefly these are very difficult roles uh to pull off in this film especially because the actors are operating uh within this concept that uh, you have talked about 
uh, or that you talked about just now. So what are some of the qualities or, or abilities that you were looking for when casting, for instance, Damian Bonas or uh, Yoko Igashi's uh, part? Yeah, like we wanted him to, uh, to start like being pretty grumpy and French, basically complaining all the yeah. time. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, and having an evolution and uh, to opening uh, into the end to something more uh, deep and, uh, and more, yeah. And about Yoko, it's, it's quite interesting because uh, she changed, like when we found her, we changed quite a lot the ending of the film. Mm -hmm. We were looking at first, that was supposed to, uh, to be a, a quite long monologue about this, uh, this character. And we did a lot of uh, tests uh, and tries like uh, in the casting with uh, a lot of uh, uh, really talented uh, actress. But uh, one day, uh, uh, I met Yoko at a, a, a show and she was like just dancing, uh, you know, dance inspired by Buto dance, you know, like a Japanese dance. And uh, she, it was really strong what she just expressed by her, uh, her, her body, her attitude, her movement. And uh, talking with uh, Raphael, we, we, we did a test with her, with uh, the monologue first, and then we shortened it and we shortened it. <laughs> and in the end, we felt like, yeah, you know what? Don't say anything, actually. It yeah, looks yeah, really yeah. nice when you just walk towards him. It's super strong. And maybe we're going to explain the whole thing uh, so, uh, visually with a, with a flashback instead of having like a, a long monologue explaining that. Yeah, but it's something we add, you know, it was she walked toward him, but we have this trick to make her bigger. So it was important, you know, it's like... I have something to tell you, something really important and something strong. And, uh, and so we so actually, yeah, we replace the text by something visually. Yeah. And, and she, uh, she really um, has something that can create almost a, a supernatural character. Mm. Like she, in, in the dance she does, like she, uh, she has something a bit, uh, I don't know how to say phantomatic uh, in English, like ghost, like, uh, like ghost, almost, yeah. ghost, no? ghostly. Ghost. And, uh, and we felt like it was a pretty interesting tone for the end of the film. Uh, and so, yeah, like, thanks to her, we, we changed quite a lot, the, like, the mood of the end of the film. Yeah, and I think the ending turned out incredibly well, and we'll get to that in just a second. Um, I do briefly want to talk about uh, the aesthetic or the look of this film, which is very specific, but uh, I also find incredibly varied. Um, it certainly reminded me of quite a few looks uh, I've seen before, but what were some of your inspirations uh, for the film's overall look and how did you ultimately make it your own? Um, so yes, there, is, there are a lot of influences in the, in the film. Uh, the one, you know, it depends on which part of it. In a, in a, somehow because you know it's like you know it's it's like it's it's, it's the, the answer is actually it's because there, are, there is different influences that we put together yes. that for us make make it uh, the film unique yeah. and uh, i think there's the, the, the influences we 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 quote a lot is uh, the main one is there is terry gilliam uh, especially brazil from him you know because there is all this big of uh, administration, you know, with people doing things, you know, boring things, let's say. Um, there is one other uh, movie from uh, from Koreeda, Afterlife. Oh, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's metaphorical too, you know, it's talking about um, what's uh, happening after after death. You know, people... Yeah, uh, what we really <laughs> found interesting in this film is uh, basically it's happening after people died and they found themselves into an administration and they get interviewed and all, and it's treated in a very tangible way. They are not going into a mystical place with strange lights and all that. It's like super tangible. And we find it quite interesting to treat uh, the administration of the dreams, but having like a really simple, tangible uh, administration. Yeah. Yeah, to keep going about Terry Gilliam, I forgot to say it's almost a kind of dark humor you can have in this movie and in the Monty Python too. You know, it's this kind of humor uh, too that uh, because we didn't want to have something too uh, only dramatic, like yeah. to have a bit of a touch of humor in it. Uh, so it's definitely this kind of English dark humor, let's say. Uh, uh, and for the end, you know, we, at some point we move to something a bit more horrific, you know, with uh, this moment with Yoko, 
Uh, and so we are both both big fan of um, uh, uh, GROR, mm. uh, Japanese horror from the, the 90s, no, like, so there is something in this kind of uh, ghosty <laughs> apparition, something a bit of from, from The Ring, the movie, or like all these ghost movies uh, from Japan. And uh, even, you know, the, the very end with the mad painting, it comes I from know. a pretty unknown movie uh, from the 60s named Kwaiden from Kobayashi. And uh, it's like the beginning of the j -Roar. It was already like a ghost film about tales about ghosts. And, uh, and this kind of feeling, this vibe comes from this, uh, from this movie. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, that was very interesting. And I know that you did not have a big budget on this film, um, but it's still one that seemingly requires multiple set pieces and uh, a lot of, or quite a few practical effects and, and much more. So how did you work around these restrictions slash limitations? So most of, most of the time, uh, like in, in the music videos and commercial we did, uh, we try to have a less, uh, the less uh, CGI as possible. And we just use CGI when uh, there is no other uh, solution to it. So we, we quite like to, uh, to keep it practical. And for instance, like here, there is like a, so a big swimming pool um, appearing in the big room. And so, which is like quite difficult to keep, uh, <laughs> you know, and to illustrate. And so we, uh, we've put all the money on like one big white shot in which we see this swimming pool being actually in this room. And we've done like the swimming pool in CGI. Uh, and after that, uh, now the, the audience buy its presence. So after we can make a lot of shots and we just imagine the, the swimming pool is still there. Uh, and we did like some few shots in which like we shot in actual uh, real swimming pool um, in a garden as well. And we just uh, put some uh, carpet of the main room around the swimming pool. So when we point down and we see like the, the border of the swimming pool, we still believe the swimming pool is actually uh, in the main room. Uh, it was quite a challenge um, light wise because we needed to have like the same light in this uh, exter exterior uh, swimming pool and inside uh, uh, the main room. Uh, and so the, the DOP, uh, Khalid uh, Motaseb did a, a pretty good job with that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, honestly, you cannot tell that this uh, was that there was not a big budget for this because uh, it just looks uh, incredible uh, visually. So, yeah, I think it all turned out uh, very well. On a final note, um, I read that the two of you are now working on your own feature films, um, and I would assume that every project influences and inspires the next. So is there something that you learned while working on Sensor of Dreams um, that you have either applied to this film, the film you're working on now, or will apply to future films. Uh, um, as it's a first experience, you know, uh, doing fictions, even if it's a short format film, uh, actually we learn a lot, a lot of things, you know, how to, to deal with uh, a different economy, let's say, because, you know, it's, mm. it's in different timing, you know, when you work on, a, on, a, on fiction, it's totally different from the commercial and music video industry. And, uh, and I think even the process of writing, because we are in our project, you know, on project we are writing too. So it's a skill, you know, we are directors first, first even if we, for music video, we used to write the ideas. It's a bit different here. It's, there is, it involves di dialogues, uh, all the things, even that is direct, direct, directing actors, you know, but in a different way, you know, like it's like here, it's like to tell a story. All the things, you know, uh, I mean, personally, I learned a lot, a lot from that. And obviously, it's going to help a lot for the for, for our future. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there, there is something maybe that we learned as well is like working on a very short format, such as uh, music videos and, and commercial. We, uh, we developed a fear of dead moments somehow, you know, and uh, so the first day when we uh, when we directed, we were like, we just wanted like to have every second filled with a, an idea, a concept, a line or something like that. And then we understood that uh, the, the time in the fiction is, is quite different. There is no so much dead moment or a dead moment is filled with a, like you let the audience uh, have the time to think a bit or to process an information they just got. Mm. So it's a different uh, a timing. And uh, 
we should be mm -hmm. less afraid about like having letting the camera turn and having like something like where, where nothing actually happens or like with uh, some silence you know yeah but in other hand we were really close to the storyboard and uh maybe you know the short amount of time we had to shoot everything maybe it was I think it was the fear too. So it was like, I think we found the right, right balance at the very end. It's true that we learned that. That's definitely the longer the film is, the, um, the, the most of time you can allow, you know, in the, in the shot and not being like, to not increase the pace all the time. You have many, many, many ideas, you know, like every, every each second, let's say, yeah. Wow. Uh, thank you again for, uh, so much for sharing. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, your upcoming films, uh, films, and I can't wait for more and more people to check out Sensor of Dreams. Um, I think people will be very impressed by it. Um, every, everyone who's out there watching, please subscribe to Gold Derby and uh, keep up to date with us throughout the season. Leo, Rafael, thank you so much for your time today. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. <laughs>